And especially when I say coaches, I'm talking about junior coaches, from my point of view is that they make it happen. Everybody can talk the theory. We all know the experts who sit in the grandstand or sit on the armchair, we know that. Everybody can talk the talk, but very few can put into practice and make it happen in that way. I'm mindful of a thing I was told several times ago that if you took two great coaches, you probably find you could break them into this. The ones who, when they speak, people say, listen, but then more importantly, the best ones, when they finish talking, the people under them say, let's march. In other words, they are able to entice the people that they've got under them to act, to put into practice the things that they're, being, when they're doing. They are motivators from that point of view. Easy to say, I say this time and again, but it is not easy. It is not easy because it takes an enormous number of attributes. I'm sure anybody who's done the Level 1 Coaches course, it's amazing when you look at that. One of the first things that I, I go back many years, but if I can just read here. They gave me role of the coach. And they said coaches have a diverse role which can vary according to the, uh, the age group of the team we've got. And they started to rattle off. This is what you need to be able to do. A communicator, a leader, a manager, a philosopher, a psychologist, a public relations expert, a selector, a sports trainer, a student, a teacher. Geez, you've got to be good. You've got to be good. And more importantly, geez, I must pay big money. But the reality is when it comes to junior coaches, guess what? You're doing it because it's a love. Because it's a love to put something back into it in that situation. And one of the first and foremost things is why there's a love there is because they care. It's been said people don't care how much you know about them the minute they believe you care. And I think this becomes a cornerstone of, of good coaches from that point of view. What I'd like to do tonight to try and reinforce, so I've just set that sort of little agenda. What I'd like to do to share with you tonight are some personal experiences. Firstly, from a player's perspective, and then secondly, from a coach's perspective. And I think it's important that we continue to look from a player's perspective because we've got to find out what's important to them. So often, if we don't go in with this attitude, um, we can make terrible mistakes. And you're looking at somebody who's made some terrible mistakes in that area, and I want to share some with you from that point of view. Can I talk about my first coach? And why I say that is that wherever I go around and I talk to people, I ask them, tell me about your first coach. And it's amazing because you might have had a lot of coaches in your life, but I reckon you all will remember your first coach. And you know what? You remember for good reasons or bad reasons. For me, great. My first coach is a guy called Lou Owens. And I love him. I love him. I meet him every Christmas, and I sit down and still tell him how much I owe him in that situation for what he did for me. I grew up in a place called Edith Vale, Monet Peninsula Football League. And so much of my childhood, around seven or eight, nine, ten years of age, was spent Saturdays at the local footy club. Just going down there, watching and that sort of stuff. Because you'd go down, because that's where your so-called heroes were playing at that point of time, but also because you'd have kick to kick and you'd muck around, you'd do all those other things, because you just wanted to be around people. But then a little bit of a dream started to happen for me, and that was, I'd like to be able to play for them. First, well, too young. Seconds, too young. Thirds, under 17s. So can I come down? So I pester mum and dad, can I go down? No, you're too young, you're too young. You can't go down until you go into high school. So I can remember at 12 years of age, I went down to the footy club to join in, to play in the under 17s. A lot of people have said to me when I tell that story, gee, you must have been a good little player at 12 years of age to get a game in the under-17s. And my comment was, hang on, I never said I got a game. I just went down there. For two years, I never got a game. Why did they tolerate me? Because I'll tell you why. Because the ground's called Regent's Park. It backs on the swampland and, a, and a, a golf course. In the middle of winter, when the footy got kicked over the fence and went in the swamp, as long as some silly little kid could go and fox it, he could hang around. You know what? You can, you can stay in places if you bring something of value. Wasn't getting a kick or anything like that, so I went down there. People said, why would you do that? Two reasons. Firstly, I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be accepted and I wanted to be part of something. Because growing up, when you look at it and you see these kids, sometimes we forget that for a 12-year-old, 16 and 17-year-old guys are heroes. And in this little town, I'm telling you, if I tried to hang around with those guys up the local shopping centre, I would have got smacked in the ear and get out of the way. 
But I knew if I played in that team and I could become accepted, I'd be joined and I'd be part of it. But the main reason I went there was because of the coach. And the reason, you know what? Because every coaching session at some stage, he made me feel good. At some stage, he came up to me and patted me on the back, told me something I was doing well, etc., and kept saying to me, keep this up one day and young fella, you'll get a game here. That was the reason why Monday and Wednesdays I jumped on my bike and I rode down to that ground and rode home. I know, and at that point of time when I look back on it, I took more notice of that him than my mum and dad. And I've never ever forgotten that. And this man impressed me so much that I kept going, kept going, and two years later, I remember one Friday morning I went up to the local shopping centre, there in the barber shop with the team sheets, and there was my name. I ran around to Lou's home, I knocked on the door, he answered and I said, is it true or am I in the side? And he said yes, and my response was, can I have my jumper now? And he said, why? And I told him, because I've dreamt of it. Sounds crazy, but I dreamt of the day where I get to pull that on. You know why? Because it wasn't only putting a jumper on, it was now you're being part of something. It becomes your badge of honour, and you can wear it with pride in that way. And I slept with it that night. I slept in my footy jumper in that situation. I've since had Melbourne footy jumpers, I've had premiership jumpers at North Melbourne, I've had state jumpers, but none were more important than that jumper because now I was, I was part of something and that acceptance that comes with it in that situation. But also you start to learn a lot of other different things and that is that you've got to pull your weight in that situation. You've got to do your bit. But when you do, you get to actually celebrate something more important or ever, for me than ever doing anything individually. When you share successes with teammates, it is something special from that point of view. And that was the guy who really set me on the journey, who ignited my spark in me wanting to be involved in that situation as I said. That's why I can remember, I can, I can share that with you from that point of view. Because of him, and I guess because of a few other little different things like family and everything like that, I developed my talent. And I got to win best and fairest in the competition and everything like that. And then everybody was telling me, wow, you're going to play footy. You're going to play league footy. And I was just over the moon that I'm going to play league footy. And I got an opportunity and I went to one club and at one club, you know, after training, they said, oh, you've got a bit of talent and ability, son, but uh, don't worry about coming back. Why is that? Well, you'll never make it. I said, why is that? And they said, because, son, you're too small. You're too small and you're too skinny. And I went away devastated. A couple of weeks later, I got an opportunity to go to another club. The following week, another club. Three clubs told the same thing. At 17 years of age, tried out three clubs, and every one of them told me not to come back because, what? Because of my stature. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm shattered. I'm shattered and I've lost total faith in myself from that point of view. And then I got an opportunity to go to Melbourne Footy Club. I went to the Melbourne Footy Club and I couldn't believe it. What happened is that before I even trained, they asked me to sign up and become a player because based on what the recruiting guys said, they thought I was worthwhile and they signed me up. I thought this was going to be sensational because, obviously a long time ago, but in that 10 year period up until I went there, and in that year that I signed up, which was in the September of 1964, when they would win a premiership, in the 10 years leading up to that date, they played in eight grand finals and won six premierships. And now I'm asked to sign on and become part of this. And I'm just looking forward to how good this is going to be. You can imagine that reaction. I go out in the MCG under a man called Norm Smith, who's the coach. And there's these fantastic players, Brassy, Dixon, Mann, all these guys, fantastic names at that time. Guys who had won five and six premierships. And now I'm out on the MCG training with them. <coughs> 15 minutes into training, Norm Smith calls a halt to training. As you can imagine, they already comes in, they do the review of the drill. And he turns to me and says, young Alves, he said, there are two things that stand out about you. I went, wow, how good is this? He said, the first thing is you can do every kick in the book. I'm going to tear my chest went out like that. Until he said, but you can't do one right. And I started to shrink. And then he said, and the second thing is, son, you're running around like a chook with your head cut off and you're stuffing up training. And I'd like to wish you all the best wherever it is, but it ain't here because we've got a premiership to win. And so I was told to leave the ground. 15 minutes. That's all I lasted. And when I went in, I was absolutely devastated. I thought it was the end of the world. Until a short time later, he rang me and asked me to come and have lunch with him. And he sat down at lunch and he told me, in his own mind, 
that as good as I was, he didn't think that I could make it. And I'm thinking, how many times do I need to hear this? And then he said this, and this is why he's a great coach. He said, however, never let it be said that Norm Smith denied somebody with such a passion the opportunity to fulfill your dream. Even though I don't think you're gonna make it, he said, son, I've enrolled you in a gym and I'm gonna throw a challenge to you. And that challenge is, a long time ago, obviously, in the off season to try and put a stone and weight on. You put that stone and weight on, I'll let you play in one practice game next year and we'll take it from there. If you don't put the weight on or don't go to the gym, all bets are off. Shook my hand and got walked away. At that point of time, you can imagine my thoughts about him were anything other than positive. But I come to understand why he was great. See, he understood that what I presented would not be sufficient, but he did not discount me. And I think one of the greatest lessons I've got from him and other coaches to understand this, in every person, bar none, there's a spark of greatness. The challenge of coaching or leadership is to find out what you need to do to ignite that spark. And when you do that, let me tell you, things happen that you couldn't even believe, even from that person's point of view. And that's what this man understood. So even in that situation, in this cutthroat thing, he had my interest at heart and he wanted to find out if there was something in me that he could draw out to do that. And I went to this gym and I'm going to share this because it's not a, this is not a football coach, but this is a coach of people. And I learned so much from him. Because at this gym, it was run by a man called Stan Nichols. And as I walked into this gym, Mr. Nichols came and introduced himself and I responded. And then he said to me, tell me young fellow, what are you doing here? And I started to explain to him. I said, I've been sent by the Melbourne Football Club. And he put his hand in front of my face like that and said, get out of my gym, son. I don't deal with people like you. And turned and walked away. Left me standing there, absolutely gobsmacked red-faced, terrified, with every eye in that room burning through me. He looked back at me and said, I thought I told you to go. I said, I don't understand. He said, I asked you what are you doing here? And I said, well, I tried to tell you. Norm said, he said, son, I don't deal with losers, get out. So second time. And now I'm really shot. And then this magnificent man turned and said to me, young fellow, I'm going to ask you again, but this time before you answer, I want you to listen. He said, I asked you, what are you doing here? And lucky I heard him. I said, I'm here because I'm going to put a stone and weight on and I'm going to play footy for Melbourne. And his words were, righty, oh young man, let's go to work. He then offered me this. He said, Stan, understand this. People do not do their best by being told. You may do something when mum and dad, the teacher, the coach, the boss tell you, it will never, ever be your best. The only time you'll be your best is when you want to and when it's going to get you what you want. He pointed some other people in the room. He said, that, see that person over there? He plays Davis Cup tennis for Australia. See that girl? She rose for Australia. And so on. And then he said, you know why they're here? Because they're prepared to do the things that will get them what they want. If you're here purely and simply because somebody's told you to be here, I can't help you. But if you're here because you want to be here, you will be prepared to do the things that will get you what you want. Over the course of three months, twice a day, six days a week, I had to go to the gym. There were times I wanted to chuck it in. And this magnificent man would come up, he'd sense it, and he would just say to me this, is what you're doing going to get you what you want? This was the start of understanding ownership. This is the art start of understanding what motivates people and how to get the best out of people in that situation and stuff like that. This is where we hear today the terms that are thrown out. This is empowerment, but it's the stuff that's been known by great coaches and great leaders forever and ever from that point of view. But I think from my point of view, in the naivety of youth when we're going through, sometimes we just don't understand it until it's later on. But those things become so critical in that situation. And because of that, I was able to play that one practice game because I put that weight on and it led to all the other different things. If it hadn't been for good people being for me, any one of those journeys, none of those things would have happened. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have been invited here to talk to you tonight. And yet some people think it's about what did you do? No, it's about what did people do to help me get what I wanted became the cornerstone. So those things are always there. But as I said, sometimes you're so, I'm so pent up in my own performance that I forget about others. But now all of a sudden I'm in a situation where what about and how does that translate to coaching? And how can I talk to you that will bring some relevance to what you're doing from that point of view? I know that some people aspire to be great coaches. 
You'll hear people say, I'm a career coach and all those different things. I also know that others will fall into it and I come into that other category. And I'm talking about coaching in your own right. I'm not talking about an assistant coach because I've been assistant, assistant coaches to me, geez, it's an easy gig. You just sit about three steps away, you don't wear any heat. But I tell you what, you go from there to sit in the hot seat and it's totally different. Everybody loves the assistant coach because they don't think you're the man who's left them out of the side and all those different sort of stuff. So I've been assistant coaching, but now all of a sudden I get the opportunity to coach in my own right. How did it come about? It came about one Christmas time where I'm sitting home around the swimming pool and my son Matthew comes around with about five of his mates. And I said, oh boys, how you going? I said, good. They said, Mr. Ellis, we never talked to you. I said, why? Well, you know we play for Morty Brayside and the juniors. Yeah. Well, would you be interested in coaching us next year in the under 14s? Why is that? Well, Mr. Thompson can no longer do it because of work. And with your background in footy, we think you'd be fantastic. I thought about it about that quick and said, boys, I appreciate it, but no, I don't want to do it. I said, why is that? I said, well, I love going and watch you guys play, but there's one thing that's really bugging me. I said, what's that? When I go, you know what annoys me? When I hear people say, see that kid over there? That's Stan Owls' son. He's not Stan Owls' son, he's Matthew Owls. And this is his life. And my concern is that were he, if I coach, he may feel obligated to play. And I don't care if he plays or not. I want him to do what he wants to do. And I don't care if it's soccer, it's basketball, or it is. But the bottom line is, that's the situation. I don't want to put that pressure on him in that way. I'm happy to go and support, I don't want that pressure on him. The kids went away. When the kids went away, I, I realised also that I had something that I'd actually got totally wrong. I always thought that wisdom came from the top down. It doesn't always work that way. Because what happens is I sat there, Matthew came to me. Well, I'm sure in this room many have had children. He didn't really come to me, he actually circled me like a sheepdog for about three or four minutes. He's looking for that opportunity to actually come in. He's looking for that moment of weakness. And he came in, I remember he put his head on my shoulder about there. He said, Dad, I just need to talk to you about the decision not to coach. I said, why, pal? He said, Dad, I reckon if you coach, it'd be good for you. And you know what? It'd be great for me. I said, why is that, mate? He said, well, Dad, I've got to tell you, you're terrific, Dad. You're not an ugly parent. You don't barrack. You don't scream and shout. You don't do all those different things. You don't ever go up to the opposition or the coaches and stuff like that. He said, but there's something you're just not aware of. I said, what's that, mate? He said, Dad, whenever I play, no matter what position I'm on the ground, even if I'm here and the ball's down the other ground, I have to turn around and look at you. I said, why would you do that? He said, because I can feel your eyes burn in the back of my head. <laughs> and if you coach, you'd have to look at 17 other kids and jizz would be good for me. <laughs> See, I didn't understand. I didn't understand. <laughs> so with that, what else could I do? I became coach of Morty Alec Brace at under 14s. I was actually over the moon until several things happened and I'll share them with you. First and foremost, the thing that rocked me was I'd inherited the dumbest group of under 14s God's ever put breath in. Now you can laugh, you probably th you thought you had it, but I had it. I'm going to tell you, because I'll tell you how dumb these kids were. When I said to them, tell you what's important in footy, you know what these dumb kids said? Have fun, enjoy yourself, work with your mates, da -da. and I'm saying, what about the winning, you little idiots? And then I realised who's dumb. I'd forgotten all those lessons, hadn't I? This is not about me. This is about them. What's important to you? And so I said to them, OK, share with me. Share with some things then. If I take this on and these type of things, tell me some of the things that you think are really important that you want to do. And one of the first and foremost things that came to me was, can we all get a fair go? So what do you mean by that? It's the same guys playing the same position every week and the rest of us make up numbers in that situation. You know, and we just know that. But gee, we'd love to get a chance to play in our favourite positions in that way. So I'm thinking, OK, well, hey, I can do this for you, but there's got to be a trade-off. Because I've got to tell you, you know, I found out there's about 28 guys coming to training. Everybody's going to have to get a go. I'm going to have to work this out. But I'll tell you what I'll do. If you write down your three favourite positions and help me out, what I'll do is I'll guarantee you that if we rotate, but it means that sometimes you might have to play in positions you don't like. Are you comfortable with that? Yep. So they write them and I get them and collate them. Absolutely fantastic. The first thing that stood out to me was I was going to have the most attacking side ever in the history of under 14s. 
Not one kid put him defensive side of the centre. <coughs> so that stood out to me. But one other little kid had an impact on me. Because he wrote this. My favourite position number one is forward pocket. Fantastic. My second favourite position is the other forward pocket. <laughs> My third favourite position is I don't have one. And so I said, mate, talk to me about this. And he said, Mr Alves, you know I'm nearly always last pick and I'm not very good. You know what? I'll never ever get in the best players. But Mr Alves, if you play me in the forward pocket, one week if we're really having a good game, I might fluke it and kick a goal and get my name in the local paper. How's that for honesty? Now I've got to tell you, ever since that day, I've looked at the results in any community I go at local sport, as long as I've got a magnifying glass. It's about that tiny. But how big is it to him? How big is it to his mum and dad? How big is it to his grandparents? Recognition. The recognition and that acknowledgement in that situation. We've got to have people in that, in, in that scenario where they understand that there's something in it for them in that way. And so we started to do that. And I started to ask a few little different things that were just important in that way. But also I guess that one of the things that stood out to me was the fact that I was also aware in those few years leading up that there was a few concerns. And one of the major concerns was the reaction of parents. Because what I'd seen is a situation where there and in this competition, they had scores. And what I just see, I could just see the moods change dramatically depending on the scoreboard. Because you can say what you like. So to me, one of the things I had to do is I had to start to become proactive and not reactive. And so one of the things I thought I might do was I put together two things. Firstly, from my point of view, a coaching philosophy. Because up until that point of time, somebody said to me, give me your philosophy on coaching. In other words, if somebody asked you, can you describe what you're on about in coaching? And I couldn't. I couldn't tell you what it was. And so for me, there's a lot of ways of going in it, but this is just me. I had to think about all the things that were given to me and try and put that down in so at any time it was there and I could look at it to determine how you're going as a coach. Because one of the things I wanted to eliminate was scoreboard mentality. If we ever get caught up in, in China, in junior sport especially, looking at the scoreboard to determine how we're going, we're in big trouble. Because it's only a historical marker, but it doesn't tell us why, it tells us, tells us what we're trying to achieve. And so I came with this and I'll just share it with you. It will take me probably a few seconds to tell you, but it took me a long time to do it. My coaching philosophy is to take a group of talented individuals, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, hopes and aspirations and dreams and desires, and develop them into better players both on and off the field, whilst at the same time mould them in the team with a common goal and help guide them to the attainment of that goal. That was for me to stay on track because I, that was the thing that was cornerstone, and I won't break that down, but if you listen to it, <coughs> you'll see most of the things that comes back to what the kids have been telling me in that situation I need to walk towards the next thing. And the next thing is that that's the situation, and that's the way I feel, and I get the kids on side. What about the outside influence? And the first outside influence was obviously the parents. And so therefore, by putting a number of things together, I, I developed, as rough as it may seem, a letter. And this letter, two copies were given to each player to take home, to be read, and one copy to be brought back to me, signed by the parent and the player. This was a prerequisite to that person being available for selection. I won't go into it in full detail, but give you some sort of idea. Dear player and parents, this year the under 14s will only train one night a week. I'll tell you why I did that. When I asked them who was available to train and what nights, Friday night was the only night I could get them all together. So my belief is why have two and three nights a week if there's different people every time? So in this situation, I want common thread to happen, this will go. But I follow up by saying this, this will ensure it does not affect their schoolwork or other commitments. I'm soft soap the parents. We will be training at different times, etc. This season I'll be concentrating on three areas to teach, to be fair, and to enjoy. And I've gone through and explained by that. To be fair, what I've said this, all players will get at least two quarters per game, all players will be tried in a variety of positions. 
enjoy, I won't read it all, but some of it says, to win is great, and we'll certainly be trying. So I'm not going to deny that, because that's a competitive spirit in everybody. However, it's not the most important thing at this stage of a player's career. If we give our best and enjoy what we're doing, we can feel proud of ourselves. There's no disgrace in losing if we've done our best. And I've gone on to other different things. So this became, to me, critical because what I want to do is to make sure that I'm on the same page as the kids are, but so are the parents, to try and take some of that pressure off in that, from that point of view in that situation. So that was the first and foremost thing. The next thing that stood out to me was we did not have a club succession plan. And this worried me greatly. Because what was happening is the coaches led up. I didn't know what they were coaching the kids. I didn't know what I was responsible to do and what the group, next group would be handed to us in that situation. And I'm happy to say now, and I think Rob's going to talk a little bit more about this later on, having a coordinated program within the club. Because it can be so disjointed from that point of view. And I'll give you a little example of what I mean by that. There was one boy who had come through our program, and it started under 10s, and I got them at under 14s. This boy had won the best and fairest in the competition every year. Not just the team, the competition every year. Got to a fantastic kid. But you know what? He had no skills on his non-preferred side of his body. He got through this situation. Now, I guess what? He was bigger and stronger than anybody else. He could get the footy, run and bounce the ball and kick a goal. Of course he was going to be. So the challenge, though, is where's the responsibility when you finish this kid if I haven't done that? Because you know why? At some stage, the early developers, they catch up with them. But when they catch up with them, they might have had to work in other areas in that situation. So all of a sudden, we started to do things, and this boy, Chris, I remember we started to talk to him about that situation, and we started to work on things in that way to make him better at that level. So again, I just think, again, the ignorance at this point of time was because people were coming in and out, but there was not a coordinating thing. It was almost, hey, um, I ask what I need to do, and they say, no, you'll be right because you've, you've played footy at the top level. But I hadn't coached children. And I was just flying by the seat of my pants, and technically I needed guidance and I needed help. To me, that becomes so important, and I'll, hopefully I'll finish on that in that, that way. The other thing that became important to me was the fact that and I just come back to thinking of things and I talk about that ownership. One of the things I, I said on this letter was that I'd like the, as many parents as possible to turn up to help out in that situation because we need assistant coaches to be able to run the drills and do those type of things. How many reckon turned up? Well, certainly if it was cold, none. I'm going to show you that. Most of them just turned up in time to drop the kids if they brought them by car. And they shot through. So now I'm faced with that situation, what am I going to do in that way? I don't have assistant coaches like league clubs now, you can see 10, 12 of them. But you know what I had? I had 28. 28 assistant coaches. You know what? Because we started to empower them. We, by taking them on board and developing in such ways, they could actually take drills. And I'm going to show you a little way if we did this in a minute. But one of the great things out of this meant that what would happen is that I could have four or five training drills going because one drill with 28 kids, <coughs> dumb. Too many. I need to be able to break it up into drills, drills and run different drills. And then more importantly, what would happen is if I get my kids to take it, I could actually go around and look for people who needed individual attention without disrupting the drills. And so how did we do it? Well, I'm going to tell you now, it's something that I took to St Kilda. And I knew it would work at St Kilda because I could get these kids to do it at any of these age groups and they pick it up like, like so quick and they love it. What we do is before every drill, and it started off before we sit with the kids, we had a program that we would teach. And the first one was, and I'm going to just have to move away from in, in the situation. I would do this before a drill and we knew the training drill that we're doing. I would say to an individual player, give me something we need to do in this drill to make it work. And I'd get him to tell me something. Fantastic. You give me something. You give me something. And I'd walk through probably half a dozen. Give me something <coughs> to do. That's fantastic. All right, great. Let's go out and do the drill. So they haven't taken them yet. 
So they go and do the drill. The drill might go for five, six, seven minutes. Do you know what? I don't give one bit of feedback. I don't go and pick it up, I just let it happen. Then they come in and this becomes the way it is. I go to a player, give me something we are doing well. And I wait for an answer, terrific. You give me something we're doing well, terrific. You give me something we're doing well, terrific. But you know what will happen? Somewhere on the line I'll say to somebody, give me something we're doing well, and he'll be the shy kid. Met him in the group, scared to say anything, guess what happens, he freezes. And then, you know, has anybody experienced that? And what, what you know, normally happens? Somebody gets so embarrassed for him, they answer for him. And my response is, hang on, I didn't ask you. Come back, give me something. I don't care what it is, because I want a response. And when he does, I'll say, is that good? You know what will happen? Yes, and I'll say, fantastic, so do I. So then, what are we doing well? Now, next one. What do you think we could do better? You give me something we think we could do better. So we've done those two. Okay, let's go out and do it again. You know what will happen? Guess what? Two things. <clears throat> They'll go out and do the drill. You know what we're going through their mind? I better start concentrating because he might ask me something. Because you know what I'm not doing? I'm not asking the whole group. I'm actually pointing to somebody. I'm not going to let, and it might be your turn. So we get them to start the buy-in. But then the great thing about doing this technique is every time I do that, do it for, might have to do it for a couple of weeks, but everybody understands now at every drill, I'm going to ask, what are we doing well? What can we do better? And then we we'll just go out and do it, and we just start to build up on it. So how does this develop? Well, guess what? Without them knowing, running a drill. I go up to a player, and now I'm going to say to this player, without anybody knowing, when I blow the whistle and come in, you're coach. And the first reaction is, not me. Now you've got the easy bit. You're just going to stand out in the front and ask the questions. Because now all you're going to do is, what will happen is when they come in, I blow the whistle, everybody comes in expecting me. All of a sudden the player standing out the front doesn't have to be a great player, it can just any player, and I don't stand beside him, because that would take away his authority. I go and stand at the back of the group, and he now does this. Give me something we're doing well. You give me something we're doing well. Give me something we could do better. So we do that over and over again, because that becomes the situation. So guess what? Now we're training, 28 players. Okay, I'm gonna do four little grid games. Four little grid games, and that situation, you know what they are? U7, 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 and stuff like that. I'm appointing you, you're captain, you're the next captain, you're the captain, you're the captain, out you go and run the drill. But before you do the drill, better guess what you're gonna do? What does the captain do? <laughs> give me something we need to do well in this drill. You give me something we need to do. And so that just goes, and then guess what? So I've got these other little games going for one. Now I walk around and I just observe, I see what's going on, we take ownership. Where's the value of that? This is what's gonna happen in the game. Why am I doing it? Because it could happen in the game. It becomes this cornerstone to be able to do those things, but that also becomes the feedback. So the feedback becomes so critical, so even if it's in a game, I'm, what I'm gonna say, at a quarter time break or anything like that, I'm going to say to my players, give me something we're doing well. Give me something we could do better. And that situation to build on, because now that, that gives me a chance for positive reinforcement. It doesn't mean at some stage I won't give direction, but you know what? People do not do their best by being told. Remember the man in the gym? Now we're giving ownership at that level. And then go on. This becomes even more important, because understanding this, and remember that letter, I'm now bringing this in again. At the end of every game, it became compulsory that I didn't do the player review until every parent who was there that day was in the room. Because I wanted them to hear what I was going to say about their son, or, you know, and today it's even better, about their son or daughter. This became so important, that situation. And one of the things that became a classic to me was the fact that we would line up in that situation and I would go through and find out something that person had done that day and then ask for a reaction of his teammates so that they would give positive feedback. I tell this story every time because it's, to me it's so important. We played a side called Seaford at the Seaford Oval. And in this game, a young fellow, Scotty, who was one of the really good little players, he had that game from hell. 
Doesn't matter how good you are. Remember that one where you went there and the ball bounced that way? You did this and something like that, you just couldn't get it, and, it, and you just, nothing goes right for you. And at the end of the day, as we come in the rooms, his dad was full on. And he was in the rooms every week. You know why? Because when you look the best players, Scotty would have been the best players. But this week, as I looked around the room, there was one person missing. Scotty's dad. And I said to Scotty, Dad's here, and he mate said, yeah. I said, mate, you better go and get in because we can't, we can't do the review until Dad comes in. I remember seeing this kid run across the oval, go up, the cars were parked on the bank, and he's up there, and the old man's just going like that. He didn't want to come in because his son's had a dog of a day. He didn't want to be in there. And the young fella, stopped, and finally the old man must agree to it. So Scotty comes back, and the old man's about 10 metres behind him. He's almost, he's not my kid. So they come in the room, he comes in the room, kids are sitting there, guess where the old man goes? He goes up in the back corner. So we go for all the boys and that, and I remember I come to Scotty. Scotty, I've got to say to you, mate, you've had a shocking day, haven't you? How bad was that? And the kids head down that. And I said, but I'm going to tell you what, today you become a man. Gee, it's easy to, when things are going well for you. But today you had one of those days where nothing went right. But you know what? You just told your mates how much you play for them. Because in that last quarter, when you chased that guy on the other side, you really couldn't have caught him, but you busted a boiler. You showed me, you showed everybody in this room, you showed your teammates how much you felt for them, that you didn't want to let them down. How good was that, guys? <clears throat> Imagine the reaction with their teammates. Scotty, yeah, and things like that. Let me tell you, I've got this vision, and it's of Scotty and his old man walking back up the hill, and the old man's got the arm around the boy, my boy. That again is so important, isn't it? Just to understand, because sometimes if we don't get that, and that junior side of it especially, I mean, it can happen anywhere, um, that sort of stuff becomes very important. And I say that because when I went to St Kilda, the interesting thing when I went to St Kilda was none of those things happened. None of those things were just talked about, and the biggest problem I had when I got to St Kilda was the fact that they had a group who were finishing down near the bottom, and one of the reasons they were down near the bottom was their belief systems. Because after my first year there, I said to the guys, look, I'm at my wit's end. We've done all this work and all that, but we, our success is going up and it's going down. And I don't understand why we're in, we'll play well one week, next week we'll fall away. In some quarters we play well and then we fall away. And I don't understand why. And one of the players said to me, well, coach, you've got to understand, mate, you're, you're, we, we, we love you, but mate, you bulldust us. I said, what? I said, mate, you bulldust us. I said, why well, you keep telling us if we do certain things we can play finals for? We know that's rubbish. I said, why is that? They said, said, have a look at the room, there's only four good players, the rest of us aren't any good. That's what a player said to me at league level. You know why? Because that's what they'd been fed. All the time, be it media, whatever it is, St Kilda have got these four or five good players and the rest just drop away. They haven't got depth, they haven't got enough. So they've got, that's how they, and that's how they play. So my challenge is, do I believe that? If I'm going to coach this side, do I believe that? Because you know what? These guys are only grown up juniors. Do I believe that? And the answer was no, I don't. Then I thought to myself, but what about my actions, coach? And guess what? I was really part of the problem. Because you know what I used to do with those kids in the under 14s? I wasn't doing it to Gilda. Because guess what? If ever we had a team meeting and I asked for a response or I had a drill and I wanted people to take the drill, have a guess who I asked? One of the four or five good players. <laughs> what was I reinforcing with the rest of the group? And so now, guess what we started to do? Give me something we're doing well. Did it and started to break it up in that situation. And then guess what? You know what? The board calls me in. What do you want? Tell us what's going on. What do you mean? How come we're winning? What do you mean? Well, how come we're winning? This goal, this, our list isn't any good. They still believed it. But now because of that situation of giving that ownership and starting to do those things that we have put into place in under 14s. You know, we, you can talk about the rocket science and you can talk about all the other different stats, but I'm going to tell you, confidence and belief is so critical to develop of anybody at any level on that, from that point of view in that situation in that way. And so 
I, 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 I won't go much further this. I'm happy to have a few questions, but I'd, I'd like to just finish on this. One of the great things, again, for me is the journey you go on when you actually start to see this happen. It takes a lot of work to get it right. And that's why I just think coaches have taken the time to work it through, but clubs who have a program to enable people to be able to do those things, to measure what it is and we know where we're going, you just get on a great journey. Just to watch the development of people. And for me, one of the greatest things is that development goes way beyond when they finish playing or you finish with them. Because the relationships and the associations that you just have is fantastic. For me, now the St Kilda situation of guys who are now coaching in the bush and stuff like that, who ring you up and, and ask you for advice and, and say, will you come and watch training and just do sort of things and stuff like that. And even guys, as I said, to me, um, if I can just say this, it goes beyond just that. Because a guy just recently said, mate, I've lost my job. Can I come and have a chat with you? Can you give me some advice on where to go? Because one of the critical things to me is that, that one of the things we do, and especially in junior footy, is that one, we not only prepare people to, to play the game of footy, but we prepare them to play the toughest game, the game of life. We teach them what is success. And if you're half good at it, you say success is personal best. Because everybody is different. Height, weight, different ways you go about different things, different skill sets. The challenge is to show somebody, are you getting the best out of yourself? That's a winner. The next thing it teaches you, as good as you are individually, you know what? The greatest success comes when you work with others. Because you can't be good at everything. And if you try to be good at everything, you just dilute your strengths. Surround yourself by people who complement what you've got. And the great thing about team success is win-win. You get to celebrate the win with other people from that point of view in that way. And one of the other things I talked about is your capacity. It's so important today. Your capacity to handle adversity, to handle setbacks. Because we all want to go out and win, but you know what in this game? You lose a lot of the time. You don't win every contest, on during the game. You may not win at the, at the finish in the final siren, but you know what the great thing about it? You learn how to handle it. Because you know what? You can't stay with it too long. You've got to turn around and then focus on what do I now need to do to get what I want in that situation. So missing in today's society. Because we've got so many, unfortunately, who have been mollycoddled to the point of view that when some little tiny thing goes wrong, they reckon it's the end of the world. Because they haven't been taught resilience. And we teach resilience, but always with the basis of selling, selling the dream and, that, and stuff like that. And I'm going to finish on this last little one. One of the greatest things that happened to me happened about 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, my wife came home and she said, Stan, something amazing happened to me today. And I said, what's that, Dom? She said, I'm walking through the streets of Morty Alley. And this guy, about six foot four, big blonde headed guy, sings out, Judy. Look around, I had no idea who he was. And he came running across, grabbed me, embraced me and kissed me. And she said, I'm terrified. Until he said, Jude, it's Leon. who was a centre half forward in that Morty Lake brace at under 14 team. And he came over and gave her a kiss and talked about how he's going in his life and everything, stuff like that. This is the greatness, isn't it? This is the greatness of the impact that we're having on young people's lives and what we're doing for the community. That's when I talk about the importance of junior coaching, of getting it right and understanding that. Of understanding that every kid, there's a spark of greatness. And what do we need to do to ignite that spark? Get the right coach and then surround themselves by the right support mechanisms so that person understands what's required of them and can deliver the goods. Rob, I hope that's good enough. Thank you. Terrific as, as always, and I've listened to Stan speak a lot of times, and um, always one of my favourite presenters, there's no doubt. So that's why I work so hard to get to yeah. here, but it isn't hard work when I only have to make a phone call, yeah, so correct. it's great. But you know, I hope everybody has enjoyed the, the session with Stan. Anybody got any questions or anything before um, he heads back to Melbourne? Yeah. So if sure. you, you want to feel yeah, a couple I'm of questions, happy. if yeah. anybody More than happy. has got anything that they would like to ask. Don't ask why I didn't move that bloke in 97.
Are you still coaching? Um, I'm actually mentoring coaches. Um, so one of the wonderful things at the moment is I'm mentoring three guys. Um, <coughs> it's interesting to say that they're the only ones that, who know that I'm mentoring them. Because the relationship is that m other people mustn't know. I don't want other people to know that they're coming to me. So what happens is that um, one's in the amateurs, one's a country, and one's a junior coach, uh, underage coach. And what happens is I just see myself as a resource. So it's just a sounding board where they can come and talk to me because um, it's not about worrying about what other people think in the club and we can just share ideas and bounce things off and stuff like that. All I really become is a sounding board. You know, it's like one of the guys that well, I was with the other day and I was coaching the amateurs and uh, we went through a series of things and we talked about different stuff and things like that and then I finished up by saying, well, what do you reckon you should do? And he said this and I said, yeah, you're right. So I just, and that's, that's as close as I want to get, because guess what, I can walk away. <laughs> but but I, yeah, just to be involved. And, and, I, and I guess I'm fortunate why Rob says, I mean, to come along and to talk at nights like this um, is fantastic for me. Um, because, and, and I hope you understand by the things I've already said, this is not any platitudes. You're the reason why people in this room are the reason why the AFL succeeds at the top level. Because these are the people who sell the dreams. <laughs> These are the people not only sell the dreams of the ones who may play, but fall in love with the game because they give them great experiences. And if this dried up, the AFL, for all the stuff, the stuff they do at the top, they would just die in the vine. Oh, you're easy, group. Oh, thank you. Stan, in all your years of coaching, is there any player that stood out for you, either that you coached yep. or was playing when you were coaching? Um, yeah, look, I think that what happens, I, I always leave out uh, from the great players, my own players, um, because you, you become biased and, and you just fall in love with them. And I could, if, you, if you wanted me to spend the next 24 hours with, I could talk about Robert Harvey, and I, I could talk about Nathan Burke, and I, and I just rattle stuff off. I think there's an appreciation of other players and how they play the game. Um, I've always been impressed by the player who not only plays himself, but the effect he has on the team. There are some guys when they played could make guys walk tall. But I will talk about one player, and, and I'll do this from the point of view is that this again was ignorance of me. And I hope I, I, I sell this in the right way. In my third year at, uh, at St Kilda, it was a miserable night in the middle of winter. We were training at Moorabbin, couldn't get on the ground, it was just mud and slush. So we decided to do games inside and do stuff and things like that. Then just in a moment of inspiration, I said to the blokes, I'm going to give you all a piece of paper and a pen. I want you to write down who you think is the most important player in the team. To just do that, just give me a bit. And they came back and I collated them. And one guy just stood out by a mile. And I said to the group, OK, I'm not going to give it back to you now. And now just do it fair dinkum without mucking around. And they said, well, we are fair dinkum. I said, what? The guy who, by a country mile, stood out amongst the playing group, their vote, the most important person, was a guy called Lazar Vinubi. He was a ruckman, Yugoslav, about 202 centimetres, big, strong, aggressive person. He was normally our 19th man. He was normally brought in at about the 20 minute mark of every quarter. Peter Everett, all Australian ruckman, would go to the forward line and he would come in and do that sort of stuff. And so I said, why is this? And the, you know what the players told me? Because this is the guy, only guy we believe in the club who puts us first ahead of himself. This is the guy who we believe plays for us. And more importantly, when he's in the team, we think we can win. And I said, why is that? And a few of the younger kids, and we brought in a lot of young kids, said, well, because nobody messes with them when Laser's there. <laughs> he makes us walk tall. And you know what? He was embarrassed. He, went, he didn't understand that. But just that impact in, that, in, a, in this team of you know, great players, in, in that team at this point of time, in that next season, 14 of this group would be picked to play in State of Origin. So there was a guy, group who said weren't any good and they were doing that and now they've said about this sort of guy in that situation. Because he had the capacity when he went out there, he was more concerned about looking after his younger players, making sure nobody you know, beat them up and all that sort of stuff and things like that. So there was a lesson for me to understand that everybody has a role and the importance and I, and I really missed out badly on that in that situation. Is that, is that answered okay? Thank you. Uh, two part. Yep. Uh, to juniors, 
how do you work with or how do you deal with uh, your, uh, the parents of the best players that you're trying to, as you're saying, they're the guns, but yep. uh, you need to develop the other parts of the game? Yep. Um, uh, and vice versa, how do you deal with the parents that who uh, blatantly get, think their kids no good and uh, that you might see something in them all? Well, I think first and foremost is to say that every player is going to get two quarters and everybody's going to play in different situations and from that point of view, so that they'll know that. And that was a part of that letter. I'm not saying it's the answer, but for me it's what I use because I addressed the question like you did. I asked a lot of people in the fish had to make a decision. And that decision was this basis. Because I can remember, I'll tell you, there were times where we had 28. In, in this competition we're in, at quarter time the coach couldn't talk to anybody. So all we knew is that something would happen, the kids, so in, the, in, the, in the, the rooms beforehand, the team went up, and then the, the 10 players who would come on, and the 10 who would go off, knew at quarter time. And to tell them where their position was, all it was, hey, Jack, you're gonna take Bill's spot. When you're on, you just say to him, he'll tell you where to go. So at quarter time, that situation, well, you can imagine how many times this happened. You're playing in a game, and at quarter time, you're four goals in front. We're not really worried about that, but the parents are. So guess what? The 10 guys who come on just weren't really as good as the other group. So as the other side starts to kick goals and you start getting burned, what do you reckon the reaction of some of the group, the parents? They're starting to go nuts. And all I'd just say is, hey, you signed the letter. That's all I'd say, because they'd do that. The next thing was, that was the reason why afterwards that the parents had to be in the room. Because I was gonna tell them something about they wouldn't have seen about their kids. And I was going to say something about that situation. And it was like that kid, Chris Whelan, you know, who's the, the, the kid who was the, the real champion player and that thing. I can remember one game, what happened was that Chris, he's got the ball, he's running, he's got on that situation, come, he's got caught on his left side and he's about to turn and go back to get on his right and he was near the boundary line and he looked at me and went, and he went, <laughs> kicked it on his left foot. You know what? And I went, yes! And his teammates went, yes! So you can imagine afterwards in the room, what was the comment about Chris Whelan? It was about how sensational he was that day because what he did is under pressure, he knew that he had to improve himself, he had to take a risk and do that. And so therefore that's why afterwards we do find everything good about somebody in that situation to be able to do it and do those type of things. And so again, we, and I'm gonna tell you, if you're looking for it, it's not easy, it's not hard to find. All you've got to do is just break away from the situation where you know it's the easiest bit, tell somebody what's wrong with them. She said, we're all good at that. But when you're looking and you know that's the situation and you're bought into it, you're looking for something to, to find that you're going to be able to say to be able to do it. So you look for it in that way. It, and it can't be a platitude, it's got to be real. Because if you say something good about somebody and he hasn't done it, but I'm going to tell you, in any game, you'll find something. You'll find something good in that way, in that situation. And it may be, that was one of the reasons why one of the things... And I'm going, hey, Brownie, how are you going, mate? Yes, Sorry, mate, I'm nearly finished. That's why one of the things we did is we talked about looking for things that can make people better. And one of the things we talked on, that, which is one of the great things, was teach them to be able to guard the mark. Now, can I ask people in the room here, is guard the mark important? Okay? Okay, well, why don't most of us do it? Or well, if we do, why are we cracking it? Because we've got to understand is, are you guarding the mark out of something good that's happened? No, normally the bloke's either beaten for it, taken the mark, or it's been a free kick. So what's happened is normally a negative environment. But the situation was to convince our kids, and this is the under 14, so again, convince them that guarding the mark was important. I remember saying this to them. Can you imagine if we get the footy, and it's in the forward pocket, and one of our kids is going for it, and he gets it, and he looks to kick back into the centre, but there's nobody there, so he does a spin turn, gets away from somebody, and then under pressure, he snaps his shot over his, over his shoulder, and he kicks a goal. Would you be keen with, would you be happy with that? Would you? Yeah. Which is your bloody heart if you're not. He's done everything right, but he's, he's done that. Because the reality is that what happens, it was just there, if he just tapped it through, but he's, instead of tapping it through, he's done it, he's kicked a goal. Okay, what happens is it? They've got, a, they've got a footy and they've taken a mark in the back pocket. And they now kick it up to the half-back flank and they mark the ball. But if we guard the mark properly and hold them up in that situation and crib a little bit of distance, and they kick the ball again and they take the footy right up, and we don't even touch it, 
But if we guard the mark properly and we've pinched, say, two metres, and that bloke has a kick and our tall ruckman gets back in and right on the goal line touches the footy before it goes through, is that good? Because yeah. what have we done? We have saved five points, no different to the ones which is down there. And this time, the only time we've touched it's here. So was that, we was talking to our kids, so this is the thing, so let's, so how can we do it? So how can we go about doing it in that situation? So we just come up with, with training. And in training was to how we do it. Well, this is one of the things we did. We said this, that what will happen is that if we have to guard the mark and the ball's on the ground, I hope everybody can just see me and visualize this, the ball's on the ground and it's their situation. What we don't want to do is we don't want to crack it we don't want to turn around and have a go at the umpire and all that sort of stuff and things like that. Don't worry about it. Guard the mark will be that what we're going to do is we're going to put our hands up as high as we can. We're going to get like that. We're going to look at the bloke's hips to whichever way he's going. And we're going to go across like that, all right? But the difference is, so go across like that. You probably haven't picked up on it. But from the time I said that, look what happened side on. What have I just done? Look at that. There's my meter. So if the umpire says and catches me and says, come back, I don't go, what? I go back, and I go like that. What have I just done? Okay, again. And I'm going to tell you, so we talk that through the kids. Then the thing we said, okay, because if we do that, we get time and space, we put the guy to go back. But also what happens, the footy's there, what we don't do is we don't pick it up and give him the footy. What we do is we stand over the ball, we wait for him to come and get it, and as he comes in, this is what we do. We go down to pick it up. But what do we do? Don't touch it. So he'll think we're going to give it to him. So what will he do? He'll go and he'll go like that, won't he? And then what do we do? And then as he comes in this time, we've been down. He's now cracking it. This time we pick it up, but we hold it about here. So we make him come to us. He's getting a bit shitty and he's got to rip it off us. What are we doing in terms of man ups? Guess who's in control of the game? Not the bloke who's it's his kick. We've actually taken control of the game. Or if we've picked the footy up, and this bloke now we think is smart, and this guy's a left footer, we're on this side of the, the boundaries here, he's gonna go through there, so we give it to him. What we do is, we slowly toss it just to that side. So what happens is you've got to take it here, and come back here, which is a bit of a skill, so we have to work on it. So we've slowed him down and that's done that situation, which gives us time to be able to do it. Now I'm going to tell you, what does that mean? It means it's in a game that what happens if we get beaten for the footy and that bloke goes like that, he guards the mark properly, he hasn't had a kick, what am I going to talk about in the match review? How sensational are you in that guarding the mark because when you push that bloke back, we had time to get up and thought, how fantastic was he, guys? You find ways. Of course, the converse thing was, well, what happens if we, it's our kick and the opposition do it to us? So he said, oh, we better practice something on that. So the difference was, we don't want someone to come and get it, we want a second guy to come. This bloke comes in, puts one foot across in front of that bloke there, pushes him back with a bum, picks his footy up, and throws it out the side so it can nick off, and you're not allowed to ship it, just walk away here, though. So what do you think we practice at training? Some of the little drills. Now, you know all these guys are ecstatic? We did it all year, and they never got pinched once by the umpires. They might at top level, but they are ecstatic because they just broke the rules a bit. <laughs> But again, I just say that again, and I love your question, because one of the great things about coaching is to find in your own mind something that's happened before and then to work on some program, but then to do something about it, to be able to link in that sort of way. So Brownie's here, and he's got a big night, and he's, uh, Matt's committee go okay? You, you didn't get your, oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, test your depth. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of your journey. to make their kids better and to make their team better and um, because everything they do in the game is what you practice in training and the important thing is that um, you know it's all about the development of the players and teach the players the right way and everything else just takes care of itself but 
you know, as I said before, for Stan to come down from Melbourne to do this presentation for us. Two weeks in a row he's been down. It's been, you know, it's fantastic support for our coaches association and fantastic support for coaching across the region. So just as Stan goes, I'd really like you to put your hands together once again and thank you. Very much.